Good morning and welcome to this week's programme, in which we mark the career of broadcaster and political scientist Brian Farrell, who died last week. This morning, Brian Farrell, how chance played such a part in his life, at 10, sent back to neutral Ireland from his home in Manchester when World War II began. Life with his aunt, school days in Kalosh de Wirra, his first job as a travelling salesman, how he worked his way through college in UCD, his indebtedness to UCD, his early broadcasts, the impact he made in the pioneering years of television, and much more. Later this morning, this. When I was with the Salesians, for instance, he once thought he had a vocation to be a priest. It was the first time I acted on stage. He left. His first job was as a travelling salesman. And so I started on my push bike, riding all over the North City, taking orders from shops, you know, six tins of tomato juice or whatever it might be. And then UCD changed his life. UCD was magnificent for me because it, it, it opened up all kinds of opportunities. All of that later. Brian Farrell will be best remembered as a current affairs broadcaster, especially on television. I think Brian Farrell made an absolutely unique contribution to Irish broadcasting, unique contribution to current affairs broadcasting. RTE's Director General, Noel Curran, former head of current affairs. You have to remember he was also an academic, he was a prolific writer. He was just a fantastic uh, colleague for all of us in current affairs. And in and around here... Commentator on state funerals. The narrow lanes, the little streets where Jack Lynch was born and reared. State visits. Good morning, very welcome. Uh, we had a wonderful and a crowded day, Bill Clinton and the Republic. Anchoring election results coverage, this from Jack Lynch's landslide 1977. I said, Mr Lynch, you must be very happy with these results. I mean, you're going to have a massive majority. And he said, well, I'd be just as happy now that it wasn't so big. In elections, leaders' debates. The, the rest of what you're saying is just rubbish. That is a load of codswallop. Brian Farrell was a broadcaster of exceptional versatility. He always insisted, and it was so true, that his career was entirely unpredictable not mapped out in advance. My, my father was born in Scotland. Both his parents came from Wicklow, where I'm going to return now shortly. This is from a live interview with Pat Kenny on radio 10 years ago when Brian Farrell retired. Uh, my mother was born in Sligo. Her people all came from the West. They moved to Manchester before the war. That's before the First World War. And I was born in Manchester. So for the first 10 years of my life, I lived in Manchester. And uh, by now, I should have a really quite attractive... Uh, and acceptable you know, Lancashire accent. You know what I mean, lad? You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> so where did the, the accent come from? Because, I mean, you spent many, many, many times more years in Ireland than you did in Manchester. I think it was an accident. When I came, I came at the beginning of the war. I was a refugee. I was an evacuee. I you came, were dispatched. I was, my, my, God bless her, my aunt, my mother's sister and my own godmother came across to Manchester to bring me back at the beginning of the war so I'd be safe. The assumption was the war would be over by Christmas, except no one said which Christmas it was going to be. <laughs> so for the first year or two, I went to a little Christian brother school called Strand Street, just off Almond Quay. And nobody bothered too much about Irish and so on, and I was jogging along. And then one day, I was given a note by one of the Christian brothers to go up to a place called Colosh de Wirra. And I went well, up there. Everything was done. Oscar Elge. And what happened? They said, come in on Monday. I came in on Monday and that was it. So I, I spoke Irish during my whole school days and I think it kind of froze my accent. I think that otherwise... What I you should brought to Ireland with you... Stuck. S pre pretty well stuck. Otherwise I should have had a, a Dublin accent. Of course. Uh, how many were in the family, Brian? I had uh, three brothers, one sister still alive, who is now living in Galway. And how, how many of them were dispatched uh, to be I was, safe? I was the solo one. And why did they pick on you? Well, I was the youngest boy. My sister was only a baby, so there was no question of her leaving home. Uh, I don't think my brothers were particularly interested. I mean, they were young men. Yeah. They, well, they were in their late teens. All of them, indeed, were conscripted into the British Army during the war years. So my aunt was right if, that, if I was to be protected. Yeah. 
<laughs> but she ran a, this little shop near the, the fruit and vegetable market. So I almost had a foot in the Irish countryside, you know. And she looked after me extremely well. And I moved in, in one sense from being a member of a family to being an only child. And I had a fair sense that there was privilege attached to that. I got more treats than if I'd stayed at home. Mm. How did you cope with Colosh the Word, though? I mean, you're looking at this, I think, although you'd been over and back to Ireland on holidays, I believe, prior to mm. your permanent move. Um, I mean, it must have been double dutch to you looking at the the cupola fuckle I, I i can't tell you how i survived i mean i suppose as you throw someone in the deep end they'll learn to swim uh, i i've often pondered <laughs> the peculiarity of learning latin through irish when i knew neither latin nor <laughs> irish and if you think of your early days in latin and think of the sentences you know mullen on bowrian on mornelach regina Nautam Amat, the Queen loves, loves the same. You could have lived your life in the Gaeltux. You'd never hear the phrase. You'd never hear one <laughs> of the words. <laughs> How'd you do in the leaving? I didn't do well. I was in a very top, I was in an A class in Kloshwara. I have to say I wasn't very happy in Kloshwara. I found it a tough school, a hard school, a very good school. Uh, but I was in the, the A class, the scholarship class, and I reckoned the strategy was stick around the middle. Don't be so good that you have to be pushed hard. Don't be so bad that you have to be beaten up. <laughs> Just stick around the middle. So I, I emerged with my leaving cert with only one single honour in uh, English. You must have been a fierce disappointment to the brothers in Kalash to wear. Well, I don't know. I think they, they, <laughs> they rode with the punches, you know. At that point, he thought he had a vocation to become a priest. At that time, on what was then Radio Air, there was a children's programme called Saints You May Not Know. It was a very nice little dramatised life of m relatively modern states. And there was one programme called The Saint Who Walked the Tightrope. And this was Don Bosco, who was the founder of the Salesians. And he sounded very attractive to me. And at that time, it was quite common. I mean, I'd say at least a third of the chaps going through would have a shot at some religious order or another. And the religious orders came round the schools to recruit and so on. And it's extraordinary how many people in high places oh, sure. at one point thought they wanted to be priests and then found other ways. I it's mean, the John Irish, Hume is one, isn't he? Uh, yeah, he's Maynooth, the Irish equivalent of military service in many other secular states, you know. Mm. So how long did it take you to realise you went to the novitiate? I started, in effect, the Salesians at that time had an Anglo-Irish province, so it was mainly in England, they had many schools in England, and they wanted their people to have English qualifications. I had a leaving, a very ordinary leaving, but I was set to the task of, in effect, repeating the leaving on it was called the Higher School Certificate. It was the British equivalent of matriculation so I did really two years solid school work, and I enjoyed it immensely I mean there was a what great was the difference ah uh, I think the whole atmosphere was different first of all there was a sense that you were all together there was no sense of fear there was no sense that uh, you, somehow or other you would be slapped because you didn't know your lessons that was all totally removed and there was great encouragement I mean when it, when I was with the Salesians for instance was the first time I acted on stage there in some little play or other we were doing and there was great great encouragement to say and I think they they did set themselves the task to try and give people a chance to grow and he recalled in this interview the moment when he reckoned he did not have a vocation there was lots of time to think and reflect that's part of what the, the job was at the time uh, I, I reckon it wasn't really for me and I can remember lying in the dormitory one night a, a, a spring evening and hearing the topoka topoka of people playing tennis I was, I, then nor now do I play tennis I know nothing <laughs> but somehow or other there was this sense that there's a there's a whole world out there and you don't know anything about it yet his first job was as a commercial salesman. My aunt, as I say, ran a very small little dairy shop and she got most of her goods from a small wholesaler around the corner, Leonard's in Little Green Street near the, near the courts. And the son of the house, there were two brothers, ran the business. One of them had a son who became ill, unfortunately, and had to go to hospital. And he asked my aunt, he used to be in my aunt's buying cigarettes every day or whatever it was, asked my aunt, would, would I stand in as a commercial traveller? while the, the, the young man was in hospital. And so I started on my push bike, dry, riding all over the North City, taking orders from shops, you know, six tins of tomato juice or whatever it might be, and a dozen eggs, or, well, really a hundred eggs, which was 120 eggs, but that's another day's work, um, <laughs> and collecting the money for them. And I did that, that the poor man died in hospital. So I in a sense drifted into this job, but realised I'd, I'd have to do something else, and I went up to sign on at UCD extramural programmes. 
and uh, I, initially I made inquiries to see if I could start to do a degree but that collapsed very quickly because they were on a three year cycle and mm -hmm. this was the beginning of the second year so it wasn't going to be available and I started into extramural adult education programs and realised it wasn't quite meaty enough and by pure hap chance luck luck has played a great role part in my career. I met one of the Jesuits who was running the scheme in UCD and he said, why don't you think of going in as a day student? And I said, I, I knew nothing about universities. Mm -hmm. Nobody in my family had ever been close to a university. I said, I couldn't possibly afford it. And he said, but do you know how much it is? And I said, well, no, I don't. And it was, I think, £30 was the fee, which although a significant amount of money, wasn't an impossible amount of money. Mm -hmm. So I started into UCD as a day student keeping my other job a part-time, so I worked my way through for a year and a half, selling my butter and eggs and tin things on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday afternoon, sun Saturday afternoon going in doing the, the books for the wholesale company. And I think I got three pounds a week for that, and that kept me going. And you rose uh, to the very top. I mean, in UCD, ultimately you became professor. Uh, you, I'm I, not talking about being the you, administrative you, you, boss. You, UCD was magnificent for me because it, it, it opened up all kinds of opportunities. I enjoyed my work. I, I intended to do an English degree. In fact, I drifted into the history department, which was magnificent. It was very well staffed, very exciting. And uh, I, I got a very good first arts degree, but I was too old to get a scholarship because by then I was 21. And Aubrey Gwynn, who was a Jesuit professor, stopped me and said, I believe you're working. Why? And I said, I need the money. And he said, if we gave you the equivalent of a college scholarship, would you give up the work? And I said, yeah. So Christmas of my second year, I effectively got a scholarship through the rest of my undergraduate years. Mm -hmm. And then on the BA, I did a BA on pure history, just history and history it was called. Um, I got a, a Dublin Corporation scholarship, Michal O'Clary scholarship in Irish history, and that paid me £100 and the college topped it up. And then I applied for, I was nominated for the equivalent of a Fulbright. Okay. So I was so lucky. At all every the, step. All the breaks happen, but they don't come without working for them and they don't come without talent. So. You know. Well, they don't come without working, but work, I th don't think, is a real problem if you are lucky enough to be doing something that's satisfying for you. And I had endless energy. I mean, at that time, I can remember uh, at the end of my second year in UCD, I went back in the summertime to work at my grocery business. I, I did a walk-on in the Gate Theatre for two months with the, the uh, Lord Longford Company, and I was doing my study at the same time. The beginnings of his broadcasting career were in radio, the old Radio Air, and this was before... Uh, television began and it all happened he said by chance when I came back from Harvard I got a job in UCD I didn't expect I'd be able to get a job in 1955 there were very few jobs in Ireland the anticipation was you'll emigrate get a bit of money and go back to the States which was absolutely boom time everybody wanted you to go to the States they were very encouraging and uh, uh, part of my job I got in UCD was helping to run the extramural program where I had begun. Mm -hmm. And uh, there I used to go in a couple of nights a week to see that it all was ticking over. And I talked to the people who were lecturing, and they included Gabriel Fallon, who was a pal of Sean O'Casey's, who was a journalist at the time. And uh, he was talking to me, and he said, um, I, I had begun doing newspaper journalism by then. He said, have you ever thought of radio? And I said, no. And he said, why don't you? And I said, what do I do? He said, write to Frank McManus, which I did. And the rest, as they say, is history. At the end of my third year in UCD, uh, our, t our radio air, as it was, applied for trainee announcers. And I got on a very short course with one other man. The other man had excellent Irish, but he had only two tones in his voice, one of which was entire surprise. You wouldn't believe, but Mr. Churchill in the house comes today. <laughs> and the other one was highly confidential. Not too many people know this, but uh, and I think I was put in just to kind of bolster him up. But then I went for my final order audition and I had to read some phrase or some paragraph in Irish and I came out and there were two men in the corridor outside who obviously were the, the, the adjudication team and one said to me uh, did you spend some time in England? I said yeah I was born in, uh, in Manchester and he turned to his companion and said there you are I told you he speaks Irish with a Manchester accent <laughs> and I said good evening and law show and you but Brian Farrell began his broadcasting in radio. He was one of the commentators on John Fitzgerald Kennedy's visit to Ireland in June 1963. I had never done live radio commentary before. I got no training, but I had as my mentor, Sean McRaymond. I now hand over to Brian Farrell, who will describe to you what happens from here on. 
over the roof of that lounge where I'm still standing now, a great flurry of photographers all rushing over, angling their shots, getting ready, as we are all getting ready to see the two presidents emerge from the airport building, the escort of honor. And the two of us traveled up and down the country. We covered the, the Kennedy arrival at Dublin Airport. I was on the top of the old VIP lounge, and I looked down, as it were, between my legs, and hear a group of elderly men walking out, and behind them, this extraordinarily handsome young man who turned and waved. I thought for a minute he was waving at me. President Kennedy looks up, he waves, he's brown, he's looking very fit, walking around on his own now, he's ready to get into this open car. Door is held open, he looks up, he looks up, I think, for a moment in amazement at the crowds of people standing on the roof of this building. And then we, we went over and we covered his visit to New Ross, and then we covered his the, the famous occasion when he got honorary degrees from Trinity and UCD and was made a free man of Dublin, all in a single ceremony in an hour, just one single hour. His first experience of commenting on a state visit was on radio, and his first broadcast on election night two years later was also on radio. Brian Farrell. Well, uh, I think people, and David Thorne thinks I'm getting away with it because I'm not sticking my neck yeah. out. Jousting with his future, Seven Days television colleague David Thornley on the radio coverage of the 1965 general election. And my own belief is that at this stage to start estimating or guesstimating or simply hunching what those will be uh, is a waste of time. I mean, we will know it within 24 hours uh, and we will know it on the basis of what the people have said and so far what the people have said from constituency to constituency has varied quite an amount. David, do you think that this is being just too cagey for words? I, I, I think you are being cagey, let's I, face I it, I think Brian. you're being just too cagey for words, Brian, to be quite honest. Um, I agree that you can't um, predict this thing with any confidence. But after all, that's what we're here for, to stick our necks out. At least one of the things we're here for. And on the basis of expert knowledge, which we are supposed to possess, to fall flat on our faces to the general delectation of the listeners. And this I am prepared to do for one. <laughs> Soon enough, both Brian Farrell and David Thornley would be working together on Lilia Doolan's groundbreaking current affairs programme, Seven Days. And at the next general election, David Thornley would win a seat for Labour and Brian Farrell would be presenting the results programme on television. Television current affairs, I think, hit with a bang because Seven Days, once it started, was fairly hard-hitting programme. In the very early days, I think he must have been on Frank Hall's, uh, whatever, Newsbeat, I think it was called. His son, David Farrell. And he'd be, he'd be on the TV screen, but we actually thought that he was inside the, st the TV, and he, for a while, would sort of try and fool us. There was a little entry point, and you go in, and that worked for a few, a few times. It was once a week or whatever it was. And then, and then I just developed the idea that the only way they could get him on the TV was for him to climb up the mast. You know, this big RTE mast yeah, outside? Yeah, outside here. And that was where the studio was. So I was convinced throughout my childhood that that's where every night he would climb up his <laughs> mast and that's where he was, you know, being broadcast from. This is from a Miriam Meets programme in which two of Brian Farrell's sons, David and next Theo, spoke about growing up with their famous father. And you, Theo? For me, I, th I think the thing that I found most impressive was not that he was on television interviewing all these famous people. It was how he interacted with ordinary people. Mm. He was famous at the time, and he wore his fame very easily. I mean, he was, he was all about putting people at ease, and, and you know, he was just very relaxed about it. And yeah. I just thought that was so impressive. Mm. Almost everywhere I go, somebody has had some encounter with Dad, and it's exactly what they always say, you know, a real gent. I mean, the other difference, of course, is that we're in a culture now where there's Twitter and Facebook, yeah. and, you, and you'll know all about that. But it, what I think it says a lot about was at his time, celebrities were celebrities in, for, for what they did, not what their personal lives were about. So it was, there was a mutual respect, I think, between the celebrity and the audience that I think is long gone now. Brian Farrell may sometimes have startled the politicians with his frankness and incisive interviewing, but he also had great regard for politics and politicians. I think over all the years, even before... Uh, today, tonight, I think I only once had a row, twice had rows with politicians immediately after programmes. I find that a, a lot of the alleged rows that happen happen after the event. The politician goes home and his wife or his husband, the husband says, you know, you, you shouldn't have done that or he made you say something or more frequently party followers say you shouldn't have let him away with it. I don't, I've never had problems with politicians in the sense that I like them as a group of people. I respect them. Uh, I'm very sympathetic to them. I know no other profession in the world where, come hell or high water, every couple of years, you go on the hazard 
And if you're defeated, even if it was a bad year for your party, nevertheless, the people have said, don't want you. This from an interview with Brian Dobson. I think, inevitably, I'd think of the things I was directly involved in, uh, programmes that I did, and conspicuously elections. I, I like elections. I've always liked elections since I was a small child. And I think the election count night is the one of the great moments of television. We're not likely to exceed 70 seats. Obviously, uh, the coalition will now form a government. The indications are that when the new door meets, there will be a change of government. And it's one of the mo great moments of democracy because nobody knows what's going to happen. In advance, you can guess how the party's going to go. You can guess Brian Dobson's going to get back. He always heads the poll. And as sure as you're born on that night, you're going to get surprises. Someone you never... Remember when Brian Lenehan lost out? Nobody thought that was going to happen. And equally, you get the surprise victories. So it's a great night for raw material, and the audience is there, and nobody is better informed than the audience. They just watch it. And when tonight, today's night first came on the air, of course, it arrived at this unique moment in, in recent Irish history where we had three elections within two years, the, the departure of Jack Lynch, the arrival of Charlie Hawhey, the Fianna Fáil split, the formation of the PDs. It was an extraordinary period, wasn't it? I think, you know, wasn't it Napoleon who said he wanted lucky generals? Joe Mulholland, who was the first editor of Today Tonight, the originator of Today Tonight, was extraordinarily lucky. There wasn't a week in the first two or three years when there wasn't a major domestic political story. And also, very importantly, a time when the politicians needed television. They didn't want to go under covers. They didn't go under covers. They wanted to come out and talk. And we were there. We were on the spot. He just had this incredible depth of knowledge around politics, only, only some of which he showed on air. Noel Curran again. Because if you hit people with everything you know, you lose them. So what, what used to happen was he would do these incredibly insightful interviews and, and we would always sit down and talk about the previous show and he'd come into my office and then he would just regale me with about 10 or 15 times the amount of information he'd just gone through. He was just incredible like that. He knew exactly how to get the right amount of information across. He knew how to be insightful. He knew how to pin people down. He was a showman, I would say, without being showy in that sense. A really, really decent human being as well. Um, cared about people around him and was incredibly considerate. Very often senior politicians more reluctant to come on asking themselves the question, is there anything in this for me? And if the answer is no, then they won't do it. I think, secondly, when they do come on, longer and longer answers, people talking in paragraphs, not in sentences. One of the reasons why interviewers have to interrupt so often is that the politician or the trade unionist or the bishop or whoever it is you're interviewing who knows a bit about television will try and fill the space to prevent you asking the questions people want asked. And even presidents of the United States would be capable of filibustering in that way. News back, and first this evening, the visit of President Ronald Reagan, now only three days away, and causing advanced ripples of discontent in the country. David Hanley on the eve of President Ronald Reagan's visit to Ireland. Since the first announcement of the visit, RTE has tried to persuade Ron President Reagan that he should talk to the Irish people before he came and tell them personally about his policies and attitudes. The President finally agreed, and yesterday, in the library of the White House, he sat down for half an hour with Today Tonight interviewer Brian Farrell to record the interview which will be transmitted at 9.30 tonight, immediately after the main television news bulletin. The interview is far-ranging and comprehensive, touching on the collapse of Dayton, the dangerous situation now developing in the Gulf, the President's own reaction to the report of the New Ireland Forum, and the Administration's controversial policy in Central America. There was one area where it was felt President Reagan might be in a position directly to help one Irishman who is the prisoner of a regime supported by America. Brian Farrell asked President Reagan whether he could intercede with President Marcos on behalf of Father Neil O'Brien, who was imprisoned on a murder charge in the Philippines. I do not know the details of that. I have only recently heard uh, about that. But we've had a long-standing relationship uh, uh, dating back to the, when we were the protector of the Philippines with that government, and if there is any way in which we could be of uh, help in that, uh, we'd be pleased to do it. Brian Farrell also pointed out to President Reagan that many people in Ireland objected to his visit and that there would be organised protests, particularly against his administration's policy in Central America. The protesters indeed included the current President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins. What was his reaction to these people's protests? I feel that they're misinformed. 
uh, we know that Cuba and the Soviet Union have vast worldwide disinformation machines in which they can give out misinformation to the media and to organizations and groups and so forth. I'm sure that many of those people, if there are uh, people demonstrating on this issue, I'm sure they're probably sincere and well-intentioned. But I don't think that they know the situation. All I can suggest to some of these people who are saying this in Europe and who have evidently been propagandized is, and I don't mean this to sound presumptuous, but is there anyone of them that has access to all the information that the President of the United States has? This was a scoop for Today Tonight and for Brian Farrell as he explained to David Handley. I had said, well, what about Monday? Monday is Memorial Day. And, of course, it's a bank holiday in the United States. Uh, and apart from being a great national day, yesterday was particularly important, I think, for the president because he came into that interview straight from Arlington. He'd been there uh, for the internment of the last of the unknown soldiers. And it was fairly evident to me that he was very moved. I think one of the things that shows on the interview is that the first couple of minutes... I don't think he was concentrating too much. I think, because we had a little chat just before we started, his heart and his mind were back there at Arlington. Was it your first time interviewing Ronald Reagan? No, indeed. I interviewed him when he was governor of California on his Irish visit in 72. And uh, it says something, I think, perhaps for his capacity to use information and also for the way in which information gets to a president of the United States that very early on in the interview he he threw in and of course that he'd been to Ireland in 72 when we met he said and didn't say anything more than that. So why should people watch it? I think because there is only one president of the United States at any one time. I think because uh, it is extremely rare that we have an opportunity of watching for a half an hour a man talking about his perception of what problems are. It's not a confrontation. It isn't a ding-dong. Uh, I was very conscious that I was talking to the head of a state. He's not just the head of a government. I was also very conscious that I was talking to a man who is officially invited to Ireland. I tried to put what I thought were the central straight questions. I think it's worth watching on that basis. <laughs> And we'll hear more from the Brian Farrell Archives on Sunday morning next. This morning's programme was based on original programmes by Brian Dobson, Noel Curran, Pat Kenny, Sean McRaymond, Miriam O'Callaghan, David Handley, Joe Mulholland and myself, and Brian Farrell himself. I should also mention that the television documentary Lights, Camera, Farrell about Brian Farrell's career will be on RTE One Television in eight days' time on Monday the 24th of November. That's Monday week. Thank you for listening this morning and good morning. That programme was presented and produced by John Bowman. Good morning and welcome to this week's programme in which we conclude our tribute to broadcaster and academic Brian Farrell who died earlier this month at the age of 85. Brian Farrell from the archives, his verdicts on Sean Lamass, Liam Cosgrave, Charles Hawhey, jousting with junior minister, a.k.a. Dermot Morgan, on the loss of ministerial cars for ministers of state, his opinion of the leaders' TV debates in Irish elections, and his opinion on electronic voting versus the long count. His sons, David and Theo, remember their father, Morris Manning, remembers Brian Farrell, the UCD academic. And Brian Farrell's answer, if he had been asked to make a choice between broadcasting and academic life. You will recall last week, Brian Farrell told us of his early life, evacuated from Manchester as World War II started. My aunt, my mother's sister and my own godmother came across to Manchester to bring me back at the beginning of the war so I'd be safe. His education in Dublin, through Irish, in Caloche de Wirra. I suppose as you throw someone in the deep end, they'll learn to swim. His first job. And so I started on my push bike, riding all over the North City, taking orders from shops, you know, six tins of 
tomato juice or whatever it might be. And His indebtedness to UCD. <laughs> so I started into UCD as a day student, keeping my other job at part-time. So I worked my way through for a year and a half, selling my butter and eggs and tin things on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday afternoon, sun Saturday afternoon going and doing the, the books for the wholesale company. And I think I got three pounds a week for that, and that kept me going. His early broadcasting. He said, have you ever thought of radio? And I said, no. And he said, why don't you? And I said, what do I do? He said, write to Frank McManus, which I did. And the rest, as they say, is history. This morning, we hear from the archives, Brian Farrell, recollecting highlights of his television career. Sometimes if you have a presenter who has a reputation for doing tough interviews. Noel Curran, now Director General, is the former head of current affairs and for many years worked closely with Brian Farrell you tend not to get the range of interviewees coming forward. Sometimes senior politicians uh, just try and avoid that person. They never did with Brian, even though we gave them very tough interviews. You called it. You didn't have to. You made a judgment. It was a political judgment and it backfired. Absolutely. Well, uh, absolutely right. It was a political judgment. He was never disrespectful. He could just pin someone. He could then go into historical facts. He could be humorous. All of that. He was, he was an incredibly versatile individual. In his long career, Brian Farrell chaired the first ever televised leaders' debates between those arch-rivals Charles Sohi and Garrett Fitzgerald. You made a monumental blunder. It was an appalling thing for Fianna Fáil to have done. In the TV documentary Lights, Camera, Farrell, about Brian Farrell's career, which incidentally will be repeated tomorrow night on RTE1, Garrett Fitzgerald discussed those televised leaders' debates. They are very uh, difficult things to undertake because it's pure chance whether you... Whether you come out well or not, you can be thrown very easily. And funnily enough, in the last one, I was thrown completely. And all I could think of doing was keep on saying to Charles Hahi, what is your position on the budgetary situation? Are you going to act or not? Which is a fair question. But once or twice, but I kept on saying, because I couldn't think what else to say. And then at the end, an issue came up about Northern Ireland. And this is what happened. If he were elected to office, he would use all diplomatic and other efforts uh -huh. uh, to try uh, to remove the um, constitutional difficulty which he sees there. Uh, that was the last thing said on radio Sorry. the other day. That's a misunderstanding. Could I... Well, I, 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 I a misunderstanding. Have have that, well, I could think, we just clarify? Yeah, what, what I had I, just that, checked out I before I went to the studio uh, the thing. exact words he'd used. I had them scribbled in a piece of paper. And I started, I took it up with him, pressed the issue. He said, oh, no, that was about emigration. I said, no, it was about Northern Ireland. And I couldn't find the piece of paper. Finally, I got it, took it up. The camera focused on it over my shoulder. And I read out what was there. And it was saying that they would consider renegotiating the constitutional issues involved in the Northern Ireland Agreement. And that floored him. That was Garrett Fitzgerald contributing to the television documentary when Brian Farrell retired. But I do remember Garrett being very flustered because we'd laid out a, a protocol for the thing, the, the series of major issues that had to be discussed. And I was playing a very, very neutral role. I mean, my job was really just to move them on through the, the, agenda. the, uh, the agreed agenda. Uh, but w the, the beginning was that I would be, this would be in the form of a television programme, not any other kind of debate, and that I would open by asking each one in turn a, a very innocent, broad question so they could say whatever they wanted to say at the very outset of the program for not more than two or three minutes and Garrett misunderstood I think because his answer was very short so I then had to actually ask him several questions so to give him his allotted give time. Him his time but then it began to look or he began to feel it was an interview and I think it threw him through him badly I, I think the contrast between the two men of course was quite extraordinary that Garrett would come in on the heels bundle of papers under his arm slightly breathless and settle down not entirely highly organized and Charles Hawhey would emerge as though surrounded by a great bubble of quietude absolutely calm and on top and of course he had a trick uh, over the years I noticed uh, Charles saw him that was he very frequently would arrive earlier than the allotted time hoping to catch you out in other words if he was in studio before you were <laughs> that wasn't so good and he was uh, he was also prone I remember when he was in opposition he, he did the budget debate I think with Alan Dukes on one year and he took out a pencil and when Dukes was talking he just tapped <laughs> In a, like a metronome. In this interview with Pat Kenny, which was live on the day that Brian Farrell retired from broadcasting, he looked back over those television leaders' debates. Uh, you were there for the great encounters between Garrett and Charlie. <gasps> 
wasn't wasn't I just? I, I've, I've often looked back on the, the days of the so-called great debate, and I thought at the time, and I'm still reflecting on it now, I think it was a little bit over. There was a little bit over excitement. I mean, I regarded it as an important piece of television, but one shouldn't have regarded it as some miraculous event. I mean, in effect, we, we would have done it years earlier if the politicians would agree to the format. They wouldn't agree. And there was great excitement and too much excitement, I think, too much uh, on it as a television event and not enough concentration on content. And I don't think the format is very good on television, frankly. I think it's all too too controlled. I do remember in advance I wrote a short paper on the protocol for the visit, you know, that they would each arrive separately, they would go to separate rooms for hospitality in advance. Um, how, we, how, who would sit where? Because yeah. I thought this that this might become an issue. And I, I reflected and said, i tell you what we do. We'll put the T-shirt on my left, because in the doll, the Taoiseach of the day sits on the left of the Count Corley. So there'd be a rational basis, irrespective, even if it was his bad side, so to speak. Yeah. But in fact, that issue that didn't arise at all. Uh, in the RTE archives, Brian Farrell has given verdicts on many of the political leaders whom he has interviewed over the years. This on Sean Lamas. Uh, I mean, first of all, I was fortunate enough to see him at his prime as Taoiseach and so on. That was a very interesting time. And he was a man above all, who wasn't afraid to make decisions and to carry them through. He wasn't afraid to change his mind. He, he virtually articulated the view, you know, that if you don't make mistakes, you don't make nothing, and would try and try and try again. On Liam Cosgrave. I mean, he was in many senses an old-fashioned man. I've sometimes thought that if you got a photograph of Liam Cosgrave and his father, W.T. Cosgrave, and superimposed one on the other, yeah. they would be virtually identical. But no, I think uh, Cosgrave was very experienced. He was very shrewd and was, a, of course, a very considerable negotiator. I mean, he pulled off the, the trick of holding a coalition together for the whole life of the government, which no mean trick. And his verdict on Charles Hohey? I think uh, history is going to have a, a difficult job, as we've all had a difficult job, precisely because of the arms affair, and I still don't believe we've got to the bottom of the arms affair, and I think it is quite possible that Hohey thought, whatever he was at, that it was somehow within the area of agreed government policy. I think if he thought that he was probably almost certainly wrong, but it would be a mistake to imagine that Jack Lynch was an innocent abroad, uh, th that he didn't know that something was going on, I find, or I've always found extremely difficult. Put that on one side, I think as a minister, and I, I saw, I did his first interview when he was a parliamentary secretary. He insisted, by the way, that I go into government buildings and go over the interview with him in advance. It's uh, very curious. He was he didn't like television because he didn't he likes to control. Television is an uncontrollable thing as far as he's concerned. Uh, I think as a minister, he was very impressive. And do you remember the time when out of the blue? Uh, Smith, who was a long-time serving Minister for Agriculture, resigned, had a row with Lamas and resigned. And the story on the papers the next day was not Smith resigns, but Hohey, new Minister for Agriculture. That was a very brilliant move by Lamas, I think. But Hohey showed he could take a brief and could turn it around, could do things. And then, of course, in finance, he, he famously, of course, introduced the artist's relief, and he also, of course, gave great support in, in specific areas, particularly of older people, free transport, no television license, things like that. Um, he, he was a considerable politician by any stretch, I think. He had a great capacity, but I think there were great flaws there, including... You know, there wasn't it Fulbright who said that, or that they talked about the arrogance of power, I think if you want a living example of it, there's one. Hubris, arrogance to the point of self-destruction. I don't know whether I'd push it quite that far, but certainly I think a time came when he stopped listening and it was the, his downfall. The most challenging programmes he agreed were election results programmes, marathons, and he disagreed with the notion of introducing electronic voting, which would give instant computer-driven announcements of all counts in each constituency. I'm never in favour of it. I think that we have a perfectly acceptable system. I think anybody 
looking objectively, not just at Ireland, but across the, the whole spectrum, would say, uh, if you've got a system that works, that attracts people and still ha helps you to maintain a vote, don't change it in a hurry. And I think having uh, some experience, after all, in the United States of what happened with electronic voting, you might think several times around. I do believe, I really genuinely believe, and it's not, I don't think it's anything to do with my direct involvement, I think anything you can do that engages people in politics, that encourages them to participate, uh, and particularly encourages them to vote, you should keep it. And I think this is one of the things that does happen. I think the, the night of the results count, I've frequently said this, most broadcasting consists of relatively small numbers of people talking to or at huge audiences. But on that night, above all nights, the people talk back. Yeah. They have their say. And they always, they always catch you out. They're always surprised. Do you remember the, the year when, out of the blue, in Clare of all places, we had a, an Indian doctor returned? Inexplicable, marvellous, wonderful. Yeah. He was a superb broadcaster. Brian Farrell's sometime colleague, Miriam O'Callaghan, talking to two of his sons, David and Theo Farrell, both academics. He would be laughing and having fun with the floor manager and then he would go in and literally grill somebody in an interview with incredible ease and then be polite at the end of it. Yeah. I also remember, I mean, Dad is colourblind and so you know, it was up to Mum to make sure that the whatever, whatever, whatever <laughs> outfit. outfit he was putting together was the correct one. And every once in a while, a taxi would be sent back from RTE to get a different tie because Dad had gone into the studio with, you know, a tie that just simply did not work. And you, was it true you delivered some shirts during one election? It was Bernard and Miriam. They were uh, told to get into the taxi Your and deliver and some sister, shirts. Yeah. yeah, my brothers and sister. And um, it was, you know, the marathon sessions that you go through nowadays, yeah. I suppose. And they arrived and they were ushered into the studio and told to wait because they were about to go to an ad break. And then Dad stood up to go and meet them, and he was wearing boxer shorts. <laughs> so all through the programme, he'd been dressed beautifully above, <laughs> but below, revealing everything. Why? I don't know. Heat. It was a summer. Heat, it was yeah, 70s. It, it was incredibly hot. Those studios. <clears throat> yeah, it was incredibly hot. The Dicky Bows. Oh, you, I'd forgotten about the Dicky Bows. That yeah. was an innovation. Yeah. And I think that was a style innovation. And it was Mum's attempt to, I suppose, you know, reinvent his image. You, know, you have to reinvent yourselves. But for me, actually, it's funny. The thing I also remember, I think of all these, uh, the various programs he went through, Seven Days. Today, uh, Tonight. Today, Tonight, prime Farrell time. and not Prime Time. Was, was those famous debates between Charlie High and Gareth yeah, Fitzgerald. Those marathon debates. And what was, what was interesting was, I mean, Dad was good friends with Gareth Fitzgerald. Mm. Yeah. But if you look at those debates, mm. he... You know, Good when he conscious. stepped into the room and he was professional, he, 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 you know, dished it out equally tough to both sides. I mean, it was thoroughly professional. He grilled them all. Yes. Garrotted them all. Yes. <laughs> and it was his duty to do so, right? It was his, Absolutely. It was his duty to hold senior leaders to account. And that's exactly what he did. But he always kept respect. This was the thing that always marked him out from yeah. a lot of the contemporary journalists, I think, certainly the ones I experienced in Britain on the, on the airways. Respect yeah. for the institutions and for the people who have to keep them going rather than going in and attacking them on personal issues. Yes. But still asking always the really tough Very questions. tough questions. Yes. Brian Farrell also had a sense of humour and a great sense of mischief. Here he is from the archives, the archives not of Scrap Saturday, but of Saturday View. Welcome back, and Siobhan King of Malahide's been on the telephone. She says Ireland's the only country in the EC that provides personal cards to their ministers. Cards should not be available for the minister's personal use. They're only used on work occasions in places like Britain. Uh, we can't afford the cards, and that indeed was the sort of question that was in our mind when we phoned one of the junior ministers, and when I talked to him earlier today, he seemed to me to be very hot under the collar on the question of state cards. Minister, many of us, I think, were surprised that you, above anybody, got an appointment as a junior minister, but be that as it may, what's your complaint about having to forego this privilege? And that's what it is. Uh, well, I just want to say to you, Mr. Farrell, uh, I'll bring up that other matter with you later, but we junior ministers feel that we might, frankly, we might as well be in the, the, the back benches. Uh, and I, when I say the back benches, I mean the back benches of a CIE bus. This is an outrage. It's a disgrace. If you felt like that, you could have stayed in the back benches. Uh, well, no, that, uh, that, that wasn't necessary. Uh, I, mean, I, I feel my promotion was only uh, my due, and it was high time. 
And I, I want to say this to you now, uh, Mr. Farrell, it is very easy for you to sit there and uh, to, to attack us, but I want to say this, uh, a Mercedes has always been a junior ministerial priority. Uh, as I say, uh, one has to have a big wheel if one is going to be a big wheel. And let's be quite honest, if I wrote off, uh, uh, or if indeed between us and all harm, my guard, the driver, wrote off a Fiat Bambino or a Panda, uh, it would not have the same national impact uh, as a Granada or what have you. I suppose I mean, many of us nation. would, uh, many of us would welcome the opportunity perhaps to visit you at your funeral, but nevertheless, isn't this inevitable? Well, given the time, now look, given the time that are in it, Minister, wasn't it inevitable you take the cuts like everybody else? Well, I, no, I do not, I don't accept that at all, Mr. Farrell. Uh, the state car was a necessity, and I want to stress a necessity. Uh, a junior minister's wife, or, or indeed uh, his girlfriend, or, or both, uh, cannot be expected to do the shopping without adequate transport. How, how can one, how can you say to me, sit there in RT and say to me that we can travel the country and establish a proper working relationship with our secretaries without sufficient room, uh, you haven't even enough room to, 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 to throw a leg or a cat, I mean to swing a cat in one's own car. It is ridiculous. Minister, I hesitate to interrupt it, you, but I recall very well a predecessor of your own, and whatever about carrying his secretary around the place, he used to carry gravestones for his constituents in the back of the state car. Well, that, that's another matter, and it has never happened under our administration. And I, I want to say this, I want to make this absolutely clear to you, Mr. Farrell. We love the Mercedes, and indeed my mother and family especially. Uh, I mean, I must say, you know, and this is the personal side. People just see the hard side of po politicians. But uh, my own mother gave me a magnific magnetic uh, St. Christopher badge, you know, which will now have to come out of the Mercedes. Uh, she also gave me the little motorist prayer uh, covered in plastic, which was very nice. The constituents love that car. And my constituents said uh, they always gave me presents for it, like woolly dice and a, and a big, long skeleton to hang out of the back window, which, if I may say so, uh, without any bitterness, reserves, uh, reveres more than a passing resemblance to our beloved Minister for Finance. Now, Absolutely Minister, nothing. Minister, apart from the questionable delights the car offers to the female relatives in your family, uh, what are the practical problems you're facing? Well, I am saying to you now, uh, Mr. Farrell, that in asking us to use our own smaller cars, Mr. Jukes is, is, is in effect asking us to bend over forwards to get into them. And I personally have experienced the first of the cuts, and it's on my forehead. Uh, I nearly broke my head on the top of the, the, the saloon. It's, it's disgraceful. You don't understand what's going on. And, Minister, finally, given that you feel so strongly, and after all you're notorious, uh, you're well known as a man of principle, uh, are you proposing now to resign? Well, of course, uh, in the interest of my constituents, uh, I will carry on. You'll hang on? I will, uh, I, no, it's, it's, I, I, it, the easy way out, it would be the easy option at this stage is to walk out. But uh, I have always been prepared to, to uh, back the party and to back loyalty and purely in the interest of my constituents, not for anything that I can get out of it, not that much in it for me, uh, I am prepared to, to hold on and do service for my country. That was Dermot Morgan with Brian Farrell. Uh, there's been a big debate, an international debate, about whether television has a bias against understanding that news and current affairs on television copies drama and it copy, copies the sports and it copies, uh, for instance, situation comedies, and you get very rapid shock changes. And so the whole idea is chop everything up into very small pieces. Brian Farrell is commenting here on the John Burt Peter J bias against understanding in television journalism, key articles in the London Times and the New Statesman of some decades ago, which argued that television was recruiting too many producers who really wanted to be film directors. Television was their second choice, and they were more likely to produce impressionistic movies for television current affairs rather than analytical discussions. But I think if you're to understand the world, if you're to understand your own society, if you're to ask intelligent questions and get intelligent answers, you need space. And I think there is really nothing more dramatic than a person in authority being asked a question, a simple, straightforward question, and you see that person working through in their own mind the answer they really want to give. I think that's drama. I think it's revealing. I think it gives understanding. That's what I hope we'll be doing in my new programme. From an interview with Brian Dobson when the programme Farrell was being launched. Latterly, Brian Farrell suffered from Parkinson's. His son, David, Professor of Politics at UCD, here with Miriam O'Callaghan. Do you still discuss politics with your father? Yeah, in some ways I'm, I'm, I am so lucky. I mean, I know for Theo and the other siblings, Bernard and Miriam, who are overseas, that they don't have the luxury I do of having regular contact. I see my father every Saturday and I, I have him to myself. My, my mother's there as well, but it sort of feels like I have him to myself. And yeah, I talk politics. I talk about 
the sort of things that any son would want to talk to his father about and get advice from and that that continues to this day it's a slightly changed relationship now isn't it because of your father's health yeah he, he has parkinson's he's had it for quite a while he's been ill for quite a long time he was ill before i came home i remember how upset i was not being able to keep up with him in, t- in terms of you know all that period um so he's in he's in a nursing home and he's he's obviously affected by his parkinson's but he's still extremely lucid he still loves his irish he loves singing so you know every now and again somebody wheels out a piano and he's off it's like he's in a pub and he's singing some irish song i couldn't even begin to remember and they're all joining in so he's his old self in so many ways do you feel protective towards him now because he is more vulnerable? Yeah, there is a bit of that, but I suspect that's the same in, in all families. We go through these generational shifts. But, I, I, you know, the, I still have this thing there that I can talk to him about anything and he, he will listen and he will give me advice. So the fatherly role is still there. Is it more difficult, Theo, that unlike David, you live away? I have the luxury that when I come back, uh, I, I'll, I'll see Dad. And invariably, he's he's always in terrific form. And I think because they see me so infrequently, they are in top form when they see me. And I know afterwards, mm. the following day, he'll be really tired. And he started his broadcasting career in, in radio in 1957. Mary Wilson on Drive Time with Morris Manning when Brian Farrell died. So through so many decades of extraordinary political de- political events. That's true. I mean, he loved radio, and we forget now he, he did a, quite a number of Thomas Davis lecture, lectures where he could popularise, without, simpl- with, without making simplistic, quite complex political or historical events, and, and, and he was always a superb communicator. Uh, so, but radio, he also did a great deal of written journalism. He wrote quite a bit uh, for various papers, and his academic output... It's quite extraordinary for somebody who is virtually a full-time broadcaster. He was also he very much a full-time time academic. He never shortchanged his students. His lectures were superb. He was always available to talk to students. He was a very good mentor to students, and many of whom became journalists afterwards or became politicians or whatever. So he, he gave fully of himself, and uh, he was concentrated. I mean, he, he would give students advice. He didn't give them the advice they wanted. He'd give them hard, truthful mm-hmm. advice. But uh, I mean, he was one of the most helpful people I've ever come across. Una Claffey was another contributor to this programme, former student and former colleague. Uh, you, how did he manage to keep uh, so many balls in the air, Una? I mean, these days... Uh, it, you know, to, to move between the academic world and the, the, the broadcasting world. Uh, he was writing, as, as Morris is saying, and he, he was involved, I know, in, in later years as well on the Arts Council. Yes, well, of course, it must be said, Mary, that he had a wonderful supportive wife in Mary Therese Farrell. And, uh, you know, they had a, a fairly large family, but uh, she was very much there in the background to, you know, I suppose, keep him going in a sense. But he, he was an incredibly hard worker. I mean, as, you, as you've outlined it there. And at one stage, I know who he was doing stuff many years ago. Morris will probably remember this also for the old Irish press. I mean, he fitted into a 24-hour day, what it would take most people to fill into three days, he, and, and yet never appeared under pressure or under strain, and as Morris so correctly says, had time for everybody. Mm. And, and as Una says, you know, so, so many elements, but did he have a preference, Morris, or was that why he pursued so many different aspects? Um, I think if pressed, he would put his academic work first. He, he was first and last an academic. He loved UCD. He came from the old UCD in Earlsper Terrace out to Belfield. But his loyalty there was total and a great number of his old friends were people he had known at UCD and he maintained those friendships throughout his life. But as Una also said, and she's right, it was a great partnership, Mary Therese and himself. And Mary Therese was heroic during the last difficult years. I mean, she gave him great support and it was very much a a love story between the pair of them. And that point that Morris Manning commented on there, Brian Farrell's two careers, academic and broadcaster, This is how his live interview, on the day his broadcasting career concluded, this is how 
That interview concluded with Pat Kenny. Now, you su- successfully combined two careers, that of uh, the academic and also that of the broadcaster. If you'd had to choose, if RT said, look, enough of this day job business, we want you full time, or if UCD had said, enough of this nighttime double jobbing, uh, we need you full time, which would you have chosen? Oh, I have no hesitation at all. I mean, my, my career was as an academic. It's what I wanted to do. It's what I did. Uh, I got great satisfaction from it. I was a, a late starter because of the way my career and all developed. Uh, but that that was me. That was what it was about. At one stage, I remember going to Tom Murphy, subsequently president of UCD at this stage. He was registrar. And I, somebody had said something in the common room. And I said, you know, I'm a bit concerned about my involvement in broadcasting. If I had been a physicist or a geographer, I couldn't have combined the mm. two. But being in the politics area... The two careers meshed extremely well. But I said to Tom Murphy, what do you think? I mean, do you think I really should? Come? He said, no, it's in the interests of UCD that you continue. You're, you're showcasing for us, you know, and it was very reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> it was an answer that I wanted anyway. This morning's programme was based on original programmes by Dermot Morgan, Mary Wilson, Pat Kenny, Noel Curran, Brian Dobson, Miriam O'Callaghan, Joe Mulholland, Una Claffey and myself. And, of course, Brian Farrell himself. And a reminder that the television documentary Lights, Camera, Farrell will be broadcast tomorrow night on RTE 1 television at 11.15. Thank you for listening this morning, and good morning.